Recombinant DNA technology has widespread applications in various fields, including medicine, agriculture, and biotechnology. The initial stage of recombinant technology involves DNA preparation. During this phase, we select the gene of interest, ensuring it aligns with the production of our desired protein. Insulin, for example. Our gene of interest can be chemically synthesized, but first, we need to know its code sequence. For this purpose, today we utilize complementary DNA libraries to collect the desired gene's DNA sequence. But first, let's delve into how these libraries are constructed. The first step involves isolating the mRNA from the cell. Because most mRNAs have a poly-A tail at the 3' end, a short oligo DT molecule is annealed to this tail to serve as a primer for initiating DNA synthesis by the enzyme reverse transcriptase which uses the mRNA as a template to synthesize a complementary DNA strand. Following that, the DNA polymerase enzyme is employed to synthesize a second DNA strand. The outcome is the formation of a double-stranded cDNA molecule. Subsequently, sequencing methods are employed to determine the cDNA sequence, which is then incorporated into the libraries. Now, the gene of interest, which codes for a specific protein, can be synthesized. Once we have our gene of interest, the subsequent step in recombinant DNA technology is the preparation of a transfer vector. The vector is a DNA molecule utilized as a carrier to transport a specific DNA segment into a host cell as part of a cloning. Vectors can take various forms, including plasmids, cosmids, viral vectors, or artificial chromosomes. The selection of a vector depends on the size of the insert DNA. In the case of large DNA molecules, artificial chromosomes can be used. Indeed, plasmids are the most commonly used. They are small, circular DNA molecules found in a variety of microorganisms, notably bacteria. Following the preparation of the genetic material, the subsequent step in the cloning procedure involves restriction enzyme digestion. In this process, DNA can be precisely cut at specific sites using specific enzymes. Numerous restriction enzymes have been identified from various bacterial strains. Restriction enzymes hydrolyze the covalent phosphodiester bonds within the DNA. Some of these enzymes can cleave DNA at specific sites, resulting in the creation of sticky ends while others can cleave DNA at specific sites, producing blunt ends. To initiate the restriction enzyme digestion, the solution containing our gene of interest is treated with the addition of the restriction enzyme solution. Each restriction enzyme recognizes its specific sequence of nucleotides in double-stranded DNA and cuts the DNA at a specific location. Similarly, the plasmid vector is treated with the same solution of restriction enzymes. The most commonly used cloning vectors are E. coli plasmids, such as PUC18, which encompass three functional regions. An origin of replication that enables the plasmids to replicate independently of the bacterial cell cycle. A drug resistance gene, such as the ampicillin resistance gene. And a region where DNA can be inserted, such as the LAC-Z gene, which contains multiple cloning sites, also called a polylinker, consisting of a short segment of DNA with numerous restriction sites. Each restriction enzyme recognizes its specific sequence of nucleotides within the multiple cloning sites of the LAC-Z gene. After treatment with the restriction enzymes, the next step in the cloning process is the ligation of DNA molecules. For this purpose, the solution containing our treated gene is added into a new tube. Afterward, the plasmid vector solution is added to the gene solution. For the ligation process, DNA ligase enzymes are employed. This enzyme facilitates the joining of DNA strands by catalyzing the formation of a phosphodiester bond. The formation of this bond requires a cofactor, typically ATP, which is hydrolyzed to AMP. For the recombinant process, the ligase enzyme solution is added to the sample containing the gene and the vector. The gene is integrated into the plasmid, 
and the insert DNA is physically attached to the plasmid backbone through the action of the Lie-Guys enzyme. The next step involves introducing the plasmid into the host cell. Various transformation protocols exist, and in this video, we will focus on the chemical transformation method. For the chemical transformation, calcium chloride can be employed in the process. Additionally, competent cells, such as E. coli, serve as the host cells. For the transformation, a new tube is placed on ice. Subsequently, the calcium chloride solution is added to the tube, followed by the addition of the competent cell solution. Finally, the recombinant DNA is introduced into the tube. Then the reaction mixture is incubated for 10 minutes. E. coli is a gram-negative bacterium. Its membrane comprises the inner membrane, the periplasm, and the outer membrane. E. coli carries a net negative surface charge. This charge arises from the phosphate groups within the phospholipid molecules. Additionally, recombinant DNA carries a negative charge due to the presence of phosphate groups in the nucleotides. Because DNA carries a net negative charge and the bacterial cell surface is also negatively charged, repulsive interactions occur between the plasmid and the bacteria. As calcium chloride is introduced into the mixture and calcium ions are positively charged, they will bind to both the plasmids and the bacteria, effectively neutralizing the negative charge. This facilitates the binding of DNA to the surface of the cell. To perform the heat shock, the tube is removed from the ice and immediately incubated at 42 degrees Celsius for 90 seconds. The sudden temperature shift induces thermal stress on the bacterial cells, leading to the destabilization of the cell membrane and the creation of temporary pores or gaps. Now, the plasmid DNA is able to traverse the weakened membrane and enter the bacterial cell. Next, the tube is placed back on ice for two minutes. The cooling helps the cells recover and secures the plasmid inside the cell. Once the transformation steps are completed, the tube is removed and a recovery medium enriched with amino acids, vitamins, and sugars is added to the treated bacterial cells. Then the tube is incubated at 37 degrees Celsius for one hour. The SOC nutrient-rich environment is designed to create a conducive setting for cell recovery. After bacterial transformation, the next step in the cloning process is to cultivate the bacterial cells. For bacterial cultivation, an appropriate volume is transferred into a culture medium containing all the essential elements for optimal bacterial growth. Then, the liquid is evenly spread on the culture medium using a cell spreader. Following that, the culture medium is incubated at 37 degrees Celsius overnight. Following the cloning process, three potential outcomes emerge. Firstly, the bacteria may not incorporate the plasmid, resulting in non-transformed bacterial cells. The second outcome involves transformed bacterial cells with an unaltered vector. Lastly, the third possibility entails transformed bacterial cells with the recombinant vector. The non-transformed bacterial cells will not survive in the culture medium. This is because the medium is supplemented with ampicillin, an antibiotic lethal to bacteria lacking the ampicillin resistance gene. Consequently, only transformed bacterial cells can survive because their plasmid carries the ampicillin resistance gene, which often codes for an enzyme called beta-lactamase. This enzyme is capable of breaking down beta-lactam antibiotics, including ampicillin. After the incubation and multiplication of bacterial cells, the next step involves the selection and isolation of our transformed bacterial cells, carrying the recombinant plasmid. The unaltered vector signifies that the LAC-Z gene, which typically codes for the beta-galactosidase enzyme, can function normally. In the recombinant vector, where our gene is inserted into the LAC-Z gene, the normal function of this gene is disrupted, leading to the inability to produce the beta-galactosidase enzyme. In the culture medium, X-gal substrate is included for visual indication. The beta-galactosidase enzyme initiates a cleavage reaction on the X-gal substrate, releasing colorless galactose and 5-bromo-4-chloro-3-indoxyl. The indoxyl undergoes oxidation and dimerization, 
forming an insoluble product that leads to the development of an intense blue precipitate. So, the transformed bacterial cells with unaltered vectors will manifest as blue colonies on the culture medium. On the other hand, the transformed bacterial cells with the recombinant vector, which are not capable of producing beta-galactosidase, will appear as white colonies. Next, the white colonies, representing transformed bacterial cells with the recombinant vector, are isolated and transferred to an enriched culture medium using an inoculation loop. Following that, the next step involves the growth of the recombinant DNA. This can be done on a small scale, typically in a laboratory setting. The culture medium containing our transformed bacterial cells is used for generating additional cells that have the capability to produce our desired protein. Alternatively, production on a large scale can be achieved using large vessels, known as bioreactors. These vessels are specifically designed for processing substantial volumes of cultures for optimal bacterial cell multiplication. A bioreactor provides the optimal conditions necessary to achieve the desired product efficiently. After producing the desired protein, the next step is its purification. If the protein is produced inside the bacterial cells, a step called cell disruption may be necessary. Initially, the bacteria are harvested, often achieved through a method like centrifugation. The centrifugal force causes the bacterial cells to pellet at the bottom of the tube, effectively separating them from the liquid culture medium. Following this, the supernatant is removed, and cell disruption can be achieved through an enzymatic method using a lysis buffer. Cell disruption involves breaking open the bacterial cells to release the intracellular contents, including our desired protein. Once the proteins are exposed, chromatography methods such as affinity chromatography can be employed. For the separation process, a stationary phase is employed, consisting of a specific support medium to which the protein will bind covalently. The solution of the protein mixture is directed through the stationary phase. Our desired protein will bind to the stationary phase, while others will pass through. Next, a wash step is implemented using a wash buffer. The wash buffer is employed to remove any non-specifically bound or impurity molecules, leaving behind only the specifically bound target protein. After the wash step, the specifically bound target protein is eluted from the stationary phase. For this purpose, a new tube is used to collect the solution, then an elution solution is applied. The elution buffer disrupts the specific binding interactions, releasing the purified protein. Finally, our desired protein is ready for use. 